On June 4th, 1960, four teenagers decided to go on a camping trip on Lake Bodum in Finland. And what started as a fun camping adventure quickly turned into a horror movie, when in the middle of the night, the group was violently attacked. Three of the four were killed, and the fourth was left very badly injured and with no memory of what happened. The murders at Lake Bodum became one of the most infamous crimes in Finnish history. And it seems the story became the building blocks for teen slasher horror movies in the years to come. This is the story of the Lake Bodum murders. If you're new here, my name is Elise, and today you're going to see Elise clean and talk about true crime. So welcome back to yet another episode of Cleaning and Crime. Listen, I love to listen to true crime while I clean and do my chores. And so because cleaning and true crime are my two loves, I've merged the two. And every week I post a new motivating whole house cleaning video, while at the same time I sit in a little bubble and I tell you a true crime story that's interesting to me. So... Cleaning and crime. Now, if the cleaning footage is too distracting for you, or if you simply just prefer to listen to your true crime and not watch it, be sure to check out the Cleaning and Crime podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts. If you just want the crime story video version of today's story, you can find that on YouTube as well. So I'll put the link for that in the YouTube description box, or I'll put a thingy over my head. And we're back. Thank you guys so much for being so understanding about my lighter summer schedule. I'm having a great time at my new job, which I'm currently still part-time at, and I'm also having a great time with all my family vacations that we've saved up for the summer break. I'm almost through all the craziness. I'm going to again post in two weeks, so my next episode will be Monday, August 21st. I've also gotten a lot of Instagram DMs and emails to clean at gmail.com lately, which I love, so please keep those coming. I love the messages and I love the true crime recommendations. I recently got some really sweet messages from Samantha, Annie, Taryn, Laura, Corinne, Isabel, and Grace. So that was a very special treat. Thank you guys so much. And it looks like I have a good number of new podcast listeners, particularly on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So if you're new here, welcome. And also if you're new, be sure to check out my Instagram because over there I post the photos that go along with each story. Because if you're listening to the podcast, you don't get to see those. So they're over there just in case you want to see them. And it's also a good way for you to be more easily able to reach out to me if you want to. Now, let's get into the story. I'm excited for this one. <laughs> this case is one of my, I hate that I almost just said favorites. That's not, that's not the right word. I am super intrigued by this case. This case is captivating. It has captivated me for quite some time for many reasons. So let's talk about it. The Lake Bodum murders. Ah! I'm also putting timestamps in my YouTube description box because I'm going to tell the story in chunks. So those are down there if you need to click around. But let's start with... The crime. It's June 4th, 1960, just outside of Espo in Finland. Now listen, <laughs> Finnish, okay, has got to be one of the hardest languages to read and speak for my dumb, dumb American self, okay? So please forgive me, I will be saying everything incorrectly, but I am trying. Dear United States of America, please better fund our public education system. Thank you. Four teenagers decided to go on a camping trip. So they headed out to Lake Bodum. And this plays out like a teen slasher film. It's horrible. Now, we don't know exactly what happened that night, okay? But for dramatic effect, I'm going to tell the story pieced together from witness statements. Also, the story is from 1960 and it's from Finland. It's tough to get a lot of info. So just sit back and relax and enjoy the story. I am not an investigator. I am not an expert on this case. I am just an idiot on the internet. So, and I'm an idiot that loves to spend my time researching true crime cases. So here we are. 15-year-old Myla Ermeli Bjorklund and her 18-year-old boyfriend Nils Wilhelm Gustafsson and 15-year-old Anya Talikimaki and her boyfriend 18-year-old Seppo Antero Boisman. Huh? Now, again, American dum-dum, but some sources said their names differently than others. Some sources went with just their first names. Some sources referred to them by their middle names. I actually don't have no idea what's proper. If you're from Finland, please chime in and let me know. <laughs> Most sources actually used the middle names for the girls and the first names for the boys. So that's what I'm going to go with because that's what I actually saw the most. 
They started their day while heading to Lake Bodum with a motorcycle ride. They're going to scope out a wooded spot to camp after a long winter of very little sunlight. And each couple was pretty newly dating. Seppo and Nils, the boys, had been best friends for years. Now behind Seppo on his motorcycle was his girlfriend, Taliki Maki. And like I said, they were pretty newly dating. They'd been dating for a couple of months. And just a few weeks into their relationship, Tuliki introduced her best friend, Irmeli, to her new boyfriend's best friend, Nils. So Seppo and Tuliki Maki are dating, and now Irmeli and Nils are dating. So best friends dating best friends. Adorable. It was Nils' idea to go to Lake Bodum. He remembered going there as a kid for a fishing trip, and he loved it, so he recommended it to his friends. When they rode into the town of Espo to get gas and food and beer, the townies kind of stared at the giggly teens like they were super out of place. Espo was a small town. They weren't used to getting outsiders. Like seriously, can't you see this as an opening to like a teen slasher film? No, 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 guys, totally. It's a great lake. Trust me, you're going to love it. I've seen it before. It's gorgeous. Come on, let's buy some beer. And then a grumpy old guy at the gas station chimes in. What are y'all city folk doing down here? You don't belong in them woods. Campers go in. They don't come out. Go back the way you came. Like, right? (laughs) Comment below a horror movie that has that intro. (laughs) Don't see too many travelers around here. Where y'all headed? You have a safe trip. So the townsfolk, not used to outsiders. And in fact, some people were pissed off at campers for trampling on the nature, leaving beer bottles and messes behind. Like a local kiosk man who was stationed near Lake Bodum who was known to hate campers so much that it was rumored he once put razor blades in food that he sold to camping children. He would throw rocks at campers and he would even sneak up to people's campsites and cut the ropes to their tents with a large knife and laugh as their tents fell apart. Like, dude, calm down. If you hate campers so much, why did you set up your kiosk next to a campsite? (laughs) But I digress. Now, the teens ignored the stairs. They got their stuff. They headed for a secluded area to camp for the weekend. They found a spot where the land kind of jutted out into the water. So super beautiful, super remote, super private, a great place to swim and camp and drink beer and fool around. Let's be real. So they parked their motorcycles up against a tree. They set up their tent. The lake was cold, but the girls still went swimming and the boys watched and drank some beer. Now there were other people swimming and boating in the area, but when afternoon rolled around, Nils realized everyone had kind of packed up and left. Like all of a sudden he looked up and they were the only ones there. They ate, the boys kept drinking beer, and the girls went to bed first. Seppo told Nils that he was feeling restless and wasn't able to sleep. So the boys left the girls in the tent and they went fishing. They drank some more beer and they chatted. Some believe the conversation involved talking about their anxieties about being recent high school graduates, maybe talking about how they had 15-year-old girlfriends that they might have to break up with soon because they might need to get jobs outside of the city. And Seppo had been worried because Taliki's father very vocally did not approve of him. And she let it slip that her father almost didn't let her go on this camping trip because he didn't like him that much. At 2 a.m., the boys went back to the tent, crawled in, and went to sleep. And sometime between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m., the tent was attacked. And when I say the tent was attacked, I mean the tent was attacked. Someone from the outside of the tent was stabbing and slashing through the outside of the tent into the campers and beating the tent with something hard, like maybe a rock or a pipe. At about 6 a.m., two local 16-year-old boys were out bird watching, and while looking for specific birds to check off their list, they noticed a collapsed tent in the distance. And they also remember seeing a man wearing a light jacket with longish blonde hair walking away from the collapsed tent. But they didn't think anything of it. They're like, oh, it's not a bird, it's a guy. And they just kept on bird watching. A 14-year-old witness named Olavi was out at 6 a.m. as well fishing. He also saw a man that morning walking very quickly, he remembers, in the vicinity of the campsite. He described him as being in his either 20s or 30s with light brown or dark blonde hair, combed back, a straight build, dark pants, and a light jacket. He didn't see the tent or the campers, just the man. At 11 a.m., a local man was jogging and he stumbled across the campsite. To his horror, the tent was collapsed, shredded, and covered in blood. As he approached, he saw there were two bodies laying on top of the tent, bloody and not moving. And as he got closer, he saw Nils and his face was all bloody and he looked dead. But then all of a sudden, (gasps) Nils gasped for air and said, help me, before falling unconscious again. 
The man ran as quick as he could to get to a phone and call the police. And at noon, the police got to the campsite. They extracted Nils from the scene, got him to the hospital, and they began investigating the triple homicide. The last thing Nils remembers was going to sleep in the tent. And the next thing he remembered was waking up in the hospital. In terrible pain, not knowing what happened, not knowing where he was. He had a concussion, multiple fractures to the jaw, a bunch of bruises, and a stab wound to the forehead. His knuckles were also bruised and bloody. And he was left with no idea what happened to his friends and no idea what happened that night. One thing I had trouble confirming was if Nils actually had a stab wound or not. Some sources said he didn't have any stab wounds. Some sources said he had several. Some sources said he had just the one to the forehead. Again, I don't know. I'm just some idiot. But what we do know is that he did have a concussion, multiple fractures to the jaw, and he was pretty beaten up. But the point is, Nils survived and his injuries were much less severe than his three friends. Back at the campsite, it was discovered that Seppo and Tuliki were both dead inside the tent and the tent collapsed on top of them. And they had died from blunt force trauma from being attacked through the tent. Some sources say they had stab wounds as well, but it was the blunt force trauma that was the cause of death. Nils and Irmeli were both found on top of the tent. Obviously Nils was still alive and Irmeli, his girlfriend, was dead. And let me tell you, Irmeli got the worst of the attack. She was found undressed from the waist down and she was beaten and stabbed many times. And most of her stab wounds were inflicted after she was already dead. Like that is the definition of overkill. And the cops got to work right away investigating the scene, but things like this didn't happen there. So they didn't really know how to handle it. So they just started walking all over the campsite, all over the woods. They had concerned civilians walking around trying to help. They had the press walking around trying to help find things and take pictures. Then they had a bunch of soldiers come in and start searching the woods and searching the lake for evidence. So basically, (laughs) a shitload of people came and trampled all over the crime scene and contaminated it. So very good. Now, because of this, and because it was 1960, this case has never been solved. I know, I'm I'm really sorry. But when I tell you this is fascinating, just wait. Okay, so now that you know the crime, I'm going to tell you about the evidence that they did find. It was clear that a knife was used, but it was never found. And they believe there was either a rock or a pipe used as the blunt object. But again, not found. There was blood all over the place and teeth were scattered on the ground. I know. A bunch of personal items were stolen from the tent, like clothing, their wallets, money, Seppo's leather jacket. And some of that stuff was found scattered in the woods. Very odd. But Seppo's leather jacket was never found. And the keys to the motorcycles were stolen and they were also found thrown out in the woods. But the motorcycles were just left leading up against the tree. One of the weirdest things, Nils's shoes were found about 500 meters away from the campsite, partially buried. And there were tracks leading away from the campsite to those shoes. And we don't believe that there were tracks leading back to the campsite, but we can't really be sure because the crime scene was so contaminated. And there was blood spatter on Nils's shoes, but it was only on the outside of the shoes. There was no blood on the inside of the shoes. So investigators believe that whoever the killer was, they were wearing Nils's shoes at the time of the attack. Huh. There was also a pillowcase found outside of the tent, but it was folded up, wrapped up and tied on the ends with string, but then the string was cut with a knife. Now, after Nils woke up, he was obviously questioned right away, but he said he had no memory of the attack at all. But in a moment of delirium and probably shock, he did say that he remembered seeing a cloaked black figure with glowing red eyes. In the weeks after the attack, Nils and the 14-year-old witness, Olavi, who saw the man walking away from the campsite, were both put under hypnosis. And the police worked with the boys to try and come up with a description of the man that attacked the group of teenagers. Now, hypnosis, very controversial, but it was 1960. 
So they were super into it, and both the boys were hypnotized multiple times over about a week. After working with the boys, police came up with several composite sketches of who they believed to be the suspect. And I'm going to put the sketches up on the screen. Now, obviously, this isn't super reliable, right? All of these descriptions were brought out under deep hypnosis, so... But I still wanted to include them into our pool of evidence because we don't have much. And also, it's really interesting. And we're going to come back to these sketches in a little bit here. Okay, now, let's talk about the suspects. There have been many suspects over the years, and I'm going to go over them, but I kind of can't officially decide who I think the killer is. I think I do have a favorite, though, but you'll have to let me know what yours is. Okay, number one, Penti Soinenen. Penty was a suspect in the 1960s, and at the time of the murders, he was about 14 or 15 years old. He was a known criminal, probably suffering from some mental illness, and he lived nearby the murder site. Not only was he in the proximity, but he confessed to the Lake Bodom murders to a fellow inmate while he was in jail. But police believe that he was just a nut. Probably trying to get attention, maybe trying to get respect from his fellow inmates, or maybe it was just some delusion, but the police didn't believe him. And the police didn't believe that he had the mental capabilities to carry out a crime like this and not leave any trace evidence behind. And just his age made it not believable. A 14-year-old kid being able to take down two 18-year-old boys and two 15-year-old girls by himself wasn't super likely, especially without getting a scratch on him. So police wrote him off pretty quickly, but Penty ended up unaliving himself by hanging in his prison cell nine years after the murders. Some say on the anniversary of the murders, which is very dramatic. But I personally don't think it was him. And neither do the police. They think he was just a nut and a serial confessor. But then again, this is still unsolved. So who knows? Number two, Hans Osman. And it is spelled ass man, just... FYI, Hans Osman was allegedly, maybe perhaps, a spy for the KGB. Oh yeah. And Hans Osman also lived nearby the campsite on Lake Bodum. And he was quickly labeled a suspect in the murders for several reasons. Quick little bonus backstory on this guy. Hans Osman was a former Nazi and he was a guard at Auschwitz. And then he fell in love with a Jewish prisoner. And then when he was found out, he was removed from his position as a guard and he was sent to the front lines to go fight on the Eastern Front, which is basically a death sentence. But instead of dying, he was captured by the Russians and put into a Russian prison, where then he decided it would be a great idea to become a spy for the Soviets. Oh, yes. Now, maybe that's all true, is it? I don't know, but it's a great story. Now, Hans became a suspect very quickly because right after the murders on June 6th, Hans Osman ended up in the hospital. He shows up to the Helsinki Surgical Hospital and he's delirious and going in and out of consciousness. But nurses later said that it looked like he was faking being unconscious because he was like squeezing his eyes really tightly shut. So a doctor came over and <laughs> tickled this fucker. And he woke right up. And <laughs> the doctor came over and tickled him and he woke right up. So obviously he knew he was faking. Now Hans's clothes had dark red stains on them. So he looked bloody and he was delirious and he was speaking incoherently and he was filthy and his fingernails were disgusting. They were like all black. The nurses said it looked like he was just digging and digging in the mud. And it looked like he'd been running through the woods, they said. And I guess the pretending to be unconscious bit was a way for him to get the medical staff to treat him more quickly than the other patients in the hospital. And then when the tickling bit got them to figure out he was faking, they moved on to other patients. And that caused him to become completely hostile and cause a scene and they forced him to leave the hospital. So it's possible that his clothes are bloody, he's dirty, cool, but also Hans Osman was 36 at the time, he had a straight build. When he showed up at the hospital, he was wearing an outfit that matched the description that the bird watchers and the teenage fishermen gave of the man they saw walking away from the campsite. And he had longish, dark blonde hair pushed back. Your hair looks sexy pushed back. Just like the witnesses described the man in the woods. But what's even more suspicious is when the description of the man in the woods got out in the news, Hans Osman gave himself a haircut, cut off all his hair. That's very suspicious. And when I say that he lived close to the campsite on Lake Bodum, the campsite was actually 
on his property. No, it was a huge property, but still. And on top of all this, Hans Osman was also a suspect in another murder. Yeah. A 17-year-old Finnish girl named Uli Kaliki Sari is one of the most famous cases in Finnish history next to this one, also unsolved. She was killed in 1953, and Osman's car exactly matched the description of the car at that crime scene. And over time, police believe they've linked Hans Osman to three other unsolved crimes. So, clearly a sketchy dude matches the description of the guy seen walking away in the woods and showed up at the hospital the next day. But was it him? The police basically ruled him out because Hans Osman had an alibi for the night. I guess old Hansi over here was having a sexy, sexy affair. And he was at his mistress's house on the night of the murder. And his mistress confirmed that he was there all night and into the morning. And his mistress's brother was also in the house and also confirmed that Hans was at their house that night. So the cops thought that that alibi was credible. And that was that. Number three. The kiosk man, Carl Valdemar Gilstrom. And this one might be my pick. After Hans Osman was ruled out because of his alibi, the cops started questioning the whole town. And they also started wandering around, taking pictures candidly of everyone in town. One suspicious picture was taken of the kiosk man. Now, the kiosk man was the guy at the beginning that I mentioned who would throw rocks at campers and cut people's tents down. He had his little stand by Lake Bodom and he hated campers, right? He was a jerk of a guy. Well, cops are out questioning people and they just randomly took his picture. Now, in the picture that the police took, he's shirtless, he's leaning forward kind of threateningly, and he's giving the cops a super dirty look. Like, he super looks like he does not want his picture taken. The kiosk man was questioned by police and his home was searched, but nothing was found. But when they were there, they talked to his neighbor. And apparently, maybe, perhaps, kiosk man got super drunk one night and and drunkenly confessed to the Lake Bodum murders to his neighbor. Later, he denied that completely, but his neighbor stuck to his guns and was like, oh, no, 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 he said it. And in his drunken rant, he said that he disposed of the murder weapons at the bottom of his well. And then several days after the murders, Carl was seen pouring concrete into his well. <laughs> yeah. Now the cops heard about this drunken confession and the concrete, but Carl was like, no, that's crazy. I didn't do that. So what are they going to do? You can't just go jackhammering some guy's well to look for murder weapons, maybe, off of some gossip. So this was never followed up on. The weapons could still be there at the bottom of Kiosk Man's well encased in concrete. That is so dramatic. Anyway, Carl's wife provided an alibi for him, and she said that he was in bed with her all night on the night of the murders. And that was that. But get this. Get this. I guess Carl was maybe an abusive piece of shit, and his wife was terrified of him. And I kid you not, on her deathbed... <laughs> Carl's wife confessed that that alibi was bullshit. And she only gave the police that alibi because her husband threatened to kill her if she didn't cover for him. But now that Carl had died and she was about to die, she wanted to get that off her chest. This is the most dramatic shit ever. And it gets even worse more dramatic. In 1969, before his wife died, Carl was drinking at a bar with a buddy. And I guess Carl, again, over drinks, confessed to killing the teens at Lake Bodum. So this is the second alleged drunken confession. But I guess the buddy didn't believe him. And he said to him, well, if it really was you and you really did kill those teens, you may as well unalive yourself because that would be better than spending the rest of your life in prison. And then... Carl finished his drink, left the bar, went to Lake Bodum, and drowned himself in Lake Bodum. I mean. And there's a guy out there who's written a bunch of books about this guy because he's so convinced that the kiosk man is our guy. I mean, it's so, <laughs> it's so dramatic. The concrete in the well, the deathbed confession, unaliving himself in Lake Bodum. I mean... Give me a break. I think it's him. I think it's him. That, my opinion. 
Some people, though, do not believe it was him. One of the reasons that picture that the police took of the kiosk man where he was like all grumpy and had no shirt on, he had no shirt on. And if you look at the picture, he doesn't have a scratch on him. And it was like two or three days after the murders that that picture was taken. So you get in a big kerfuffle like that, killing three people and injuring a fourth, and you don't have a single scratch on your body. But DNA was never collected from the kiosk man. The police in recent years tried to get the kiosk man's son to offer up some DNA so that we can try and rule him out, but he refuses to give his DNA. What you hiding? But I'm not done. Number four, Nils, the surviving victim. A lot of people think Nils did it. Why was he the only one who lived? Why were his injuries less severe than the others? Why did his girlfriend get the brunt of the attack? Why were his shoes found so far from the crime scene? Nurses were suspicious of Nils from the beginning because they believed that his head wound was consistent with someone who got into a fist fight or fell on their head a distance of three to six feet. And they did not believe that his injuries could cause total amnesia. He says he never regained memories of the attack, ever. The nurses believed that it was possible that maybe he would get temporary retrograde amnesia, but total? The whole event wiped forever? People were also suspicious of Nils over the years because his story of the event kept changing. But Nils argues that his story may have changed over the years because he has no actual memories of the event. He only knows what people have told him, what he's read in the paper, and what the cops fed to him, and what he was fed during deep hypnosis. But he claims he doesn't know what in his mind is a memory, what was planted. You know what I mean? Now, Nils moved on, grew up, got married, had kids. And it wasn't until 2004 that police showed up at his door and arrested him for the murder of his friends in 1960. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A new detective was put on the case in the early 2000s. And with new DNA technology, the bodies of the three teens were exhumed. And they were able to do further testing on all of the evidence that they had. And since they had exhumed the bodies, they were able to get complete DNA profiles for all three teens. So that gave them a ton of evidence to compare to the bloody shoes and the bloody tent. Now, Nils' shoes were carefully tested, and they found that all three of the victim's blood were on the outside of the shoe. But none of the blood on the outside of the shoes was Nils. Also tested was, do you remember there was a pillowcase that was folded up and then tied up with string at the ends, and then it was cut. There was blood on it, and after examining it in the 2000s, it was determined that maybe, possibly, Ermeli had been using that as a menstrual pad. I mean, she was found with no bottoms. It would make sense that it was found, like, strewn about. Well, the pillowcase was tested, and they found another DNA profile, like an unknown DNA profile that wasn't the three dead teens and was not Nils. Now, because they believed that she had been maybe using it as a menstrual pad, they then went to like every single one of Ermeli's ex-boyfriends and tested their DNA and they found no match. And now I don't know why, but they kind of pushed that aside. And the prosecution just used the fact that Nils' blood was not on the shoes to prosecute him. And that fifth mystery DNA profile was just not mentioned at the trial. I don't know. It's very frustrating. But anyway, Nils was arrested in 2004 because of this new DNA evidence. They had a three-month-long trial in 2005 where the prosecution argued that they believed Nils was the murderer because of those bloody shoes. So because his blood was not on the outside of the shoes, that means that his injuries were inflicted at a different time than the other three. So they theorized that Nils was drunk and that he had gotten jealous for some reason, flew into a rage, got into a fight with Seppo, killed everyone, and then took the brunt of his rage out on his girlfriend. Then he fled the scene, but then he decided he should go back and stage it like he was also attacked. 
So he hid the bloody shoes, scattered some of the evidence in the woods, went back to the campsite barefoot, injured himself, and then laid down on top of the tent next to his girlfriend and pretended to be unconscious. That's that's the theory. And then he just pretended to not remember anything. But Nils was acquitted of all charges on October 7th, 2005. The court said that the evidence was inconclusive. The prosecution failed to show that Nils had like a realistic motive for killing his friends. And the fact that so much time had lapsed, they couldn't be certain of the accuracy of the evidence. So he was let go and Finland paid Nils 44,900 euros for false imprisonment and mental anguish. But he was not allowed to sue Finland or Finnish news sources for defamation. My opinion... It's the fifth DNA sample on the pillowcase for me. Like, I agree. Nils is a bit suspicious. I agree. But whose blood is that? I just can't get past that. Was there two people? Was there Nils and someone else? Maybe it was Nils and Ass Man. I don't know. We do know that it's not Hans Osman's DNA, though. Because Hans's son sent in a pair of Hans's glasses to a lab in Finland that had two tiny little black marks on the glass. And he thought it was blood. And he wanted to know if his dad was a murderer. So the glasses and the little black specks were tested at a lab. And the specks on the glass were indeed blood. But everything was tested. And Hans's DNA was not the fifth mystery DNA profile. And even though the specks were blood, it was not the blood of any of the three victims on Lake Bodum. So in my opinion, no, I don't think it was Nils. I don't, because there were so many witnesses that saw a blonde guy walking away from the campsite. And because of the fifth DNA profile. And I don't think it was Hans Assman, because he wasn't the fifth DNA profile. And he was off with his mistress, so everybody says. So those are my opinions. I don't think it was Nils. I don't think it was Assman. But finally, number five, honorable mention, the man in the photograph. Now. When Nils was under hypnosis, he gave a description of the suspect, right? And the police came up with the composite sketches. And also remember how I said the police got really picture happy right after the crimes and they were just taking pictures of everybody in town? Well, at one of the victim's funerals, a photo was taken of the crowd. Look at this. Look at this fucker. And tell me it does not look like this sketch. Look at this fucker. We don't know who this is. We don't know who this guy is. Could he be the killer? No, yes. This guy, whoever he is, definitely looks like this sketch. But the sketch came from the hypnotized mind of Nils. So, in my opinion, super, super unreliable, right? But pretty freaking interesting. But on the other hand, if you look at all of the composite sketches, look at this one. This one looks a lot like Hans Ostman. And all these sketches were made from the same hypnosis sessions. So... Hmm? <laughs> okay, so the conclusion. We don't know because this case has never been solved and probably will never be solved. Sorry about it. But I don't know. Maybe one day the kiosk man's son is going to come forward or somebody's going to give some DNA, some family member from somewhere, some 23andMe stuff, and we're going to get a match to that fifth DNA profile. That's what I'm holding on to hope for. And that's all the information that we have. That's all I could find. The Lake Bodum case has inspired books and movies and inspired the name of a metal band, Children of Bodum. I saw them in concert once. <laughs> and tourists still go to Lake Bodum, like with metal detectors looking for those elusive murder weapons. I think I'm leaning towards Kiosk Man. It's just too dramatic. But obviously, I'm the one telling this story today, so my bias is all over it. I listened to a different podcast about the Lake Bodum murders, and they clearly believed very strongly that Hans Asman, I keep saying Asman, Hans Osman is the guy. So they very minimally talked about the kiosk man and then just like dove deep into Hans Osman because everyone's got different passionate opinions. But the problem is none of the suspects fit perfectly into that little box. You know, if they did, this case would be solved. So here's what I want you to do. Leave me a comment anywhere, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and let me know who you think did it. There's no wrong answers because 
We don't have any answers. I just really want to know everyone's picks. If you leave a comment on Instagram, be sure to let me know where you listened to me or watched me. So who was it? Was it Penty, the teenage jailbird? Hans Osman, the kiosk man, Nils himself, or the mysterious man in the photo, or someone else. Let me know your thoughts. And that is the end of today's true crime story. It's nighttime and there's a frog on my window. I'm going to show you at the end. <laughs> if you liked this video, please give me a like. It helps me very much with the algorithm. And be sure to leave me a comment. Let me know what you thought. Let me know who you think did it. And feel free to leave me a comment if you have a true crime case that you'd like to request. Thank you so much for watching today's video. And I will see you in two weeks with a new episode. See you guys soon. Bye.